Good evening. This is De Facto Review, a weekly analysis of Mongolia's latest political, economic, and social issues by economist and columnist Mr. Jara Sahin. Good evening. And I'll be your host, Tik Shirult. Today's topics are on the opening of the Rashon Sukhat Railroad, the Chinese speaker's visit to Mongolia, and also the revision on the legislation on foreign investment. Chairman of the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress of the People's Republic of China, Li Jianshu paid an official visit to Mongolia between September 10th and the 12th at the invitation of the chairman of the Great State Horat, Zan Nishtar. During his three-day official visit, China's top legislator met with Mongolian President Khuris Sukh and Prime Minister Aung Irtin and held official talks with his counterpart, Zan Nishtar. At the end of the meeting, Mr. Zandan Shatter was invited to pay a visit to China at his convenience. So this visit comes at the tail end of a long summer of diplomatic visits both to and from Mongolia. And regarding the outcomes of this visit, um, what economic impacts should we expect to see in the future? Indeed, we had so many visits from Mongolia to Mongolia, and it, was, it happened after uh, Vladivostok event uh, where Prime Minister Oyung uh, went to Vladivostok and uh, also this uh, uh, Mr. Li Jianshu went there and after that Vladivostok meeting, this meeting happening in Mongolia. Well, first of all, before we talk about the economic result of this uh, visit, particular visit, we should understand that the National People's Congress of uh, People's Republic of China is the legislative body of China, highest decision-making uh, body, and uh, it has a, it is convincing every five years, and it has uh, some 3,000 members, 2,000 of them are representing um, uh, proportionally the population of China, uh, for in every time they change how many people there are one legislator legislator representing and the last one was every seven hundred thousand member people of uh, Chinese people were represented by one a national um, people's congress member and also um, quite uh, especially this congress is also represented by uh, military China has one of the largest if not the largest military, two million people uh, force. And they are also represented in the parliament. And uh, because parliament gets together once for five years, in between them, this standing committee is running the show. And this uh, standing committee is consisting of 175 members. Uh, and every two months they get together for one week. So this person, Mr. Li Jianshu, is a equivalent of our speaker. That's why this visit, from that perspective, is important for Mongolia. And once he is not the executive uh, branch of the power, legislative power, so whatever he, we have agreed with him is not necessarily his agreement. Uh, that's why, first of all, what we have requested. We can only request, and we have requested several things. He promised to, to pay particular attention, special attention, and to help. That's what is his answer. So that's why whatever they have agreed, it doesn't mean that it will be automatically completed. But however, it's important for Chinese, uh, for us, our agreement with China to be approved by the Chinese uh, parliament. So on trade, uh, well, coal is the most important uh, commodity and uh, one third of our export and uh, also the same uh, size in our budget. So we have requested them uh, to uh, have a long-term agreement for quarter even, about four to 40 to 70 million tons a year Call to be export to China uh, until the end of 2025. That was the major uh, request we made. And also, the other thing was the, another thing we have request was to extend the currency swap 
agreement. And a very interesting proposition, proposition he said, the our speaker asked him to discount the debt. That meaning probably to forgive the interest rate of that swap agreement. We have a two and a half million US dollar swap agreement, equivalent of swap agreement with China, which basically means that we will, swap means we will have a, a new yuan account, they will have a Tugrik account, so we will swap using that. So again, it's already happening, this extension several times, and now they have request again. Whether it is uh, good or not, uh, I mean, that's a separate issue. The third thing we requested Mr. Janshua is, uh, since we have new railway connection it, in Kashun Sukhait, we made a r railway in recently that was opened from Tawan the major coal mine, to the southern border. Since there is a new connection, we need to update 1955 cross-border railway agreement with China. That's first we have asked. Also, there is an intergovernmental agreement on railway transit cooperation signed by two countries in 2014. But that agreement is to still to ratify it by, to be ratified by the Chinese uh, Congress. So that, that's the request. The third one was about the construction of the highway, say also Asian highway, from uh, Zamingwood to Atambulak. So the, one of the mega projects we have talked. And also uh, about, certainly talked about the gas line through Mongolia, from Russia to China. And as you said, uh, in terms of cooperation, uh, our speaker was invited at the convenience time for him to China for paying an official visit, not just working visit, an official visit. It's uh, the highest uh, ranking level, rank, highest rank of visits, the official visits that our speaker will pay there. And uh, very interestingly, there was a remark in uh, Chinese media that they have exchanged opinions on international relations issues of the interests by each side. So that's what the, the, this trip is about. And as I said earlier, Mr. Janshua expressed that he will give a special attention to all these requests by Mongolian side and will support. So hopefully that's a short brief of this visit. Again, this visit is a, not the, the, the by function, this person is not a, a signature side. It is a, an agreement to be approved by the National uh, Congress, National People's Congress of China. Mm -hmm. So that actually ties in perfectly to our second topic. Yes, so it let's is. move on to our second topic. A heavy duty rail line connecting Taun Tatlai and Kashun Sukhat was finally put into operation last week ending a decade-long wait for the crossing. So Kashun Sukhat is the uh, land port between Mongolia and China. The commissioning ceremony of the railway was held at Taunthla Station, which is in Tsoktsitsom of Amunhoramik. It, it was attended by President Hurutsuk, Minister of Road and Transport Development, Byamtsokht, Minister of Mining and Heavy Industry, Khambatr, Minister of Economy and Development, Hurutsbatr, members of parliament and other local officials. Um, President Hurutsuk emphasized the fact that the, air, the railway was built by Mongolians and is the first railway that is 100% owned by Mongolia, making the first transportation on the newly commissioned runway the first freight train left for uh, the Taunthla to Rashansukhat route. So can you explain to our viewers why uh, this project was so long awaited and why it is such a big deal for us? Uh, there is a very good question. I can share some uh, history of the railways. Mm -hmm. Before that, a very, some additional new description of the project. This is a 2336 kilometers, 233.6 kilometers long line. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, it's a total 321 kilometers because it has two stations and six crossings. Mm -hmm. That's why additionally uh, some more, what, almost 90 kilometers longer than the physical distance between two points. Mm -hmm. 
and it can uh, it can carry from 30 to 50 million tons of co cooking coal, and it, in that way it can increase two or three times our total transport to Chinese border. And plus it also reducting the cost almost four times from uh, $47 per ton, it will be uh, around 12 per ton. Substantial reduction, of course, our cost. So more than that, this railway line will give us new access to international market. Uh, particularly, it, go, it will go, we used to have now only Tianjin connection, mm -hmm. Tianjin port. Now with this railway, we go another Chinese ports like Huanghua, uh, Tianjin as well, mm -hmm. uh, Xindao, and Jin, Jinzhou. So that opens up possibilities for different exports that's beyond China as well. Yes, in particular, the coking coal is a relatively very much value-added product, mm -hmm. and it's used for steel production. Mm -hmm. And there are many other countries that also buying steel, uh, the coking coal from other countries, from Australia, for example. So we, that means we, we, are, we are open to go to Vietnam, India, etc which also this, this very access gives also a good opportunity for Mongolian exporters of coal, not only coal, maybe copper, mm -hmm. to compete with cheaper price as they have a substantial economy of cost for transport when you go by railways. The other thing, an interesting fact was um, a Chinese Minister of Commerce made statistics in which I find that the bilateral trade uh, volume uh, Mongolia and China, between Mongolia and China, hit 9.1 billion U.S. dollar in 2021, 35% year-on-year raise. So it's always interesting to compare our statistics with Chinese so that we have more realistic picture. And this Regarding railway, that, um, the Mongolian media reported that the costs went from $47 per ton for um, coal, which we were talking about earlier, to 12 tons. But if you contrast that with the Chinese media, it said uh, the cost went from $32 per ton down to $8 per ton. So there's some discrepancy in the numbers. So yeah, you know, Mongolians now sell all the coal at the site of mine itself. Mm -hmm. And there's a very much confusing uh, statistics to that extent that we are missing 2 million tons of coal. So it is a matter of governance. Mm -hmm. The prime minister raised the issue. Uh, he finds it's a corruption issue. Mm -hmm. And we will see what will be the result of that investigation which is going on. So that's why it's very important to compare our statistics with the Chinese one. You know, this railway has also a certain social economic impact, impact because it, first it's a drastically reduced pasture destruction, dust, noise, air and soil uh, pollution, and also it, it substantially reduced the number of traffic accidents, mm -hmm. what's happening uh, by trucks on this uh, road. And it will make, of course, a road safer. And uh, most importantly, it will create 2,000 permanent jobs who will take care of this railway transportation. It's new culture, it is new villages coming. Mm -hmm. And um, so it, it also, just by very basic estimate, it will support the tax, annual tax to the government's coffee. It is around 44 million US dollar tax mm -hmm. in different form. And um, <clears throat> Time, uh, it will increase also Taiwan mining network by two or three times total mining volume. So altogether, it's a lot. A lot has economic uh, impact on that. Uh, on your question about why is it happening now, that's a very interesting story, because almost well now 12 years ago, the company uh, which owns a part of Taiwan uh, which is called MMC. That company got 12 years ago everything, money, feasibility study. They were supported by Hong Kong Stock Exchange. 
And then suddenly, now political issue comes uh, when the permission they needed to get from the Minister of Transport. And that time, our ex-president, Patolga, was Minister for Road Transportation. He completely refused. And more than that, he that time also made himself a documentary film where he shows how dangerous is this if we have uh, connected with China railway, China uh, by the railway of Chinese gauge. Because Mongolia has a wider 85 millimeters wider gauge than the Chinese. Chinese is an international one, but Mongolia has the Russian railway gauge. So he said, as soon as we will, if we will make the same narrow gauge, then Chinese tanks will come. That was the documentary he was completely. Mm -hmm. And even <clears throat> also the parliament made special law which allows industrial railways or import-oriented, export-oriented railways can be of narrow gauge. Mm -hmm. But both were neglected recently when the uh, president Batholga became president, and then suddenly very quick decisions come to complete this uh, railway. Then even uh, without any tender, one company, Bodhi International, was selected by their president, and everything related to uh, that contract was kind of a state secret. We don't know much uh, really about what is exact cost and what is the conditions. I was told, for example, they will get the investment get back through selling coal, which part, how, we don't know yet. But we know one thing, Tavon Talga company, Irtnis Tavon Talga made Tavon Talga Railway, which will own 66% of this new railway. By the way, it's not only the new railway to the southern border, but also another railway to the eastern uh, port, Mongolian port Sainshan, which will go to the, another Chinese port. Mm -hmm. So somehow, Tawan Tolgoi Railway will have only 66%. We don't know what will, who will own this 36% of this uh, railway. It looks like Bodhi International, who made this railway. So it's a long story. At the end, we, we, we lost a lot of value. Mm -hmm. we, have, uh, we have even lives, many drivers had accidents, for example. Regarding that, would this decision, how does this affect the drivers that tr transport coal through um, the border every day? I mean, it, it will decrease, but will that change um, a lot of these people's lives, do you think? First of all, they would not need 15,000 trucks currently around there. At least three years ago I was there and I saw the terrible conditions where the truck drivers leave at the border. Mm -hmm. With the, they, first of all, they bring from Tawan Talga the coal to a place called Tsagan mm Hat. -hmm. And then from Tsagan Hat they uh, get together in one place piled all the coal, the tons of coals, or I would say a, a mountain of coals. Mm -hmm. Then it was reshifted again to Chinese border. So this is a substantial change. Probably there will be way less truck drivers because the road will be still there. Probably at the beginning some 30% will be at least on that road. And with that lower uh, amount of drivers, the conditions will be better, I guess. Mm -hmm. But however, what we know about uh, the railway is from the recent the opening ceremony, the total cost was 1.3 billion US dollar, and many domestic subcontractors participate in the project, mm -hmm. and there are some 500 plus local companies have been working on that, including <clears throat> military. So that's what we know so far. So let's move on to our third topic. Uh, our third topic deals with <clears throat> the revision of, leg of the legislation on foreign investment. The Ministry of Justice and Internal Affairs unveiled the draft res revision of the legislation on foreign investments, which is a key part of the new revival policy and the, the Vision 2050 long-term strategy for the development of Mongolia. A dialogue was held on the le legal issues surrounding foreign investments, and the minister, Mr. Niambatar, opened the conference with a pledge to help facilitate the solving of legal issues that foreign investors may face in Mongolia. So what does this 
revision mean for the future of foreign investment in Norway? Does this well, actually, create a more welcoming environment for investments? It, it is. Uh, we, the draft is ready from the government side, and it will be discussed at the end of this year. Because Mongolia needs so much foreign direct investment, because we have already a limit by attracting from international market through bonds and other securities. So all the thing now, we need to re-attract foreign direct investment if we want to boost the economy. Because domestically, these resources are limited. Mm -hmm. But for, uh, for inviting more, more foreign direct investment, they need to change law. So some laws are you know, really confusing. You know, originally, uh, in 1993, uh, the first law about foreign investment law. The name was foreign investment law. It required only 10,000 US dollar to be a foreign invest company. And uh, the, the law has not specified by how many people. So that's why 10 Vietnamese come, came and each put $1,000 and it's uh, already a foreign direct investment company. Mm -hmm. So there was some other flaw, et cetera. Not in, not in the substantial sector, we had suddenly foreign, you know, out of nowhere companies and which local companies could do, et cetera. So there were a lot of critics about that law and which after 10 years, no, almost 20 years, this law is changing. Now, instead of foreign direct investment, the law in 2013 is called investment law. Mm. Make no difference between domestic investor or international investor. And uh, which is pity because uh, foreign investment is investment that is coming from outside to the country. It's one legal different story. But uh, the domestic companies, investment is a domestic investment. So they are somehow confusing under, there was a certain lobby I remember. Now according to that investment law, 100,000 US dollar is required to be qualified as a foreign direct investment or foreign company. So that means uh, Mongolians at least must have 20,000 or 20% 20 of the company, which was still a high requirement for joint venture company, for joint venture company, yes. And the other thing was with the new law, of uh, new law, I mean, now already old, it's uh, 10 years old already. Uh, the registration went to state registry. Mm -hmm. And nobody was making statistics this before about exact foreign direct investment amount. So they, they need, that's why they need to change. But there are many other things why they need to change the foreign investment law, and I hope it is in the draft. For example, foreign direct investment law, or investment law, whatever it is called, exempting from certain taxes. But however, this is not reflected in the general taxation law. So that's why many foreign companies are not exempted, though in one law is written, the other law it's conflicting. So that's one of the other reason. One of the reasons. The other reason was all legal disputes for all these years uh, took so long time, years. There was a, <laughs> a record case. One case took 16 years to be solved. So legal disputes in Mongolia so much, you know, staying longer that many Mongolian companies even now registering their companies in Singapore, and in the case of arbitration, they go under the Singapore law. So it really, Mongolia needs to change this law in a plus. There were certain bad practices. Uh, one of them was in, uh, mentioned again by uh, Mr. Nyambatar. It is the case of Japanese investor who was falsely accused with a drug. Then he had to leave the country after some months uh, in jail. Um, the, the, the court found that there's no reason to put him into the jail. And that land he had, his company had, Suruga, had a, 
uh, was taken by ex-government officials, including the head of GIA, General Intelligence Agency, General Prosecutor, as it was stated by the Minister Nyambatar. So in this environment, for Mongolia, it is not easy to attract foreign direct investment today immediately. Even they change better law. We need to have, not to have a foreign direct investment, you have to create trust. That's a lot to go now. That's a challenge as well, right? Because we've had other issues, including um, the case with Boris Johnson's brother. Yeah, which is going on now, it's Max Johnson. Still going on. And so there's several know. cases, and two of them, you and just including you, what you have mentioned. Hopefully, the positive solution of the truth, mm -hmm. I mean, it is not a penalty issue, but it's the truth should prevail. If they can show it, there will be substantial steps towards to foreign uh, investors to trust in Mongolian legal system. That is all for this week. This has been De Facto Review, a weekly analysis of Mongolia's latest political, economic, and social issues by economist and columnist Mr. Jarosahin. Thank you very much for staying with us. See you next week.